hit record. There you go. All right. All righty, well, we've got up to straight up six o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started this evening. We'd like to welcome y'all to our program this afternoon, this evening on tree care. We're going to cover a little bit about trees in general, talk about some care and pruning of trees, and then we're going to focus on tree diseases. And then at the conclusion, you know, if you've got any questions, our, our panel will try and, and help answer those as well. Uh, I would like to, you know, recognize, uh, you know, my, I'm Richard Parrish. I'm the County Extension Agent in Leon County. Assisting me this evening, we've got Aaron Davis, who is the County Extension Agent in Freestone County. And we'd also like to express appreciation to Mr. Brent Batchelor, who is our Regional Program Director over in Stephenville for setting up the technology for us this evening. Our panel that will be presenting our program uh, this evening is uh, three of our Leon County Master Gardeners who are in the process of becoming uh, specialists or receiving their advanced training certification in the area of trees. So they have received some extensive training regarding trees. So they're going to be sharing their knowledge and expertise with you this evening. Our speakers for this evening will include Greg Pitts, who will be talking to us about basic tree science, what is a tree, Cynthia Torno, who will be talking about pruning of trees, and then Charlene Manning, who will be talking about disease identification and how to treat for diseases on trees. So if at any time you do have a question, uh, certainly use the chat feature and type in your question and we'll try and get those answered. Otherwise, we'll you know, uh, answer the questions at the end as well. We appreciate you joining us. And Greg, we're gonna turn it over to you to get us started. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> we're gonna start with tree science. And uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about, um, this one here, yeah. is what is a tree? <clears throat> a tree is defined as a large woody perennial plant, usually with a single erect trunk, standing at least 50 feet tall with a well-defined crown. So I usually, you know, when I look at a tree, to me, it's a big plant. But uh, you, uh, as far as the, uh, de the definition of a tree, it'd be something like 15 feet tall with a well-defined crown. Now, trees, they're either conifer or deciduous. Trees are first grouped into two main categories, which consists of 20 conifers and 154 deciduous trees. Trees with evergreen needles that stay on branches year round, have seeds and cones or conifers, like your pine trees or junipers. Trees with broad flat leaves that drop from branches each fall are deciduous, oaks and maples. Now there are many deciduous trees in Texas that stay green during the winter until temperatures dip below freezing. Now during that week when Texas had that freeze, a lot of the trees uh, lost their leaves uh, because of the freeze. And uh, they turned brown, but a lot of the trees did come back on, on, uh, after that uh, major freeze we had here in Texas. Now, trees are made up of cells, tissues, and organs. Now, life inside the trunk, outer bark. Outer bark protect, protects tree from injuries. So when someone goes around and weeds around a tree and hit, breaks that bark, what you're doing is you're letting in diseases and insects. This is why I tell people when they're uh, cutting around a tree, do not cut uh, the bark or break the bark because actually you're, you're gonna kill the tree eventually. Then you have the inner bark. It carries prepared food from leaves to the cambium layer. That's your inner bark. Then you got the cambium, which is microscopic. It builds the cells. This is what helps build the trees, make, helps the trees grow. Because uh, trees have cells just like humans have cells. Then you have the sapwood. Now sapwood carries food from roots to the leaves. So then on the inner part, you got the heartwood. It's inactive. It gives strength to the tree. This is like the, uh, the bones of the tree. It helps keep it erect or uh, keeps it strong and, you know, uh, helps you know, the tree to, uh, well, withstand you know, winds and storms and whatever. So now our leaves, we got this word photosynthesis. 
Photosynthesis is the process by which leaves make food for the tree or plant. So photosynthesis, these three major things, light, water, and air. And this is the uh, process in which the uh, trees, you know, used to uh, make food for itself is the photosynthesis. Respiration, respiration. Uh, you've got tiny holes in the leaves, which is the stomata. Stomata is plural for the many holes in the leaves. And you got stoma, which is the one hole. Trees have to breathe. So when you see a lot of trees out there, they're taking in a lot of uh, like uh, carbon dioxide. You got pollution and stuff that you know trees take in and they, and they go into those tiny holes. That's your respiration. Now, when they go in and through the photosynthesis process, the trees breathe out oxygen is what we breathe in. So it's actually, it's like a circle. So the trees breathe in the uh, carbon dioxide and all the pollutants in the air, which help uh, will clean the air and they breathe out the oxygen, which uh, is what we use in order to survive. Transpiration deals with um, like, uh, like, all right, we have perspiration where trees have transpiration. So the leaves, what they do is they, uh, they um, perspire water out. So if they, all the water they get up into the, the tree, they have to get rid of. Um, they can only hold so much water, so it's transferred. So it's trans that's your transpiration. Now those transpirations are come out through the tiny holes in the leaves and the tree itself. The tree itself does have also tiny holes. Now, depending on the size of the tree, a tree can put out 300 to 400 gallons of water a day. That is a large tree, but that is a large, that is a lot of water also. Now we've got here are the leaf shapes, we've got leaf forms. This is one way uh, when you try to define trees and see which is which and what is what, because there's just so many of them. So this chart here will, will show you the leaf shapes, the forms, the apexes, the uh, margins, leaf margins, if you look at the leaf, and the leaf bases, which is the lower part of the leaves, the bottom part. Then you've got the leaf types. You've got simple and compound. you got the needles. Needles are your on your conifers, and then you get the parts of a simple leaf and a leaf arrangement. Now, this here, you got the simple leaves and you got the compound leaves. Well, the big difference is on these here is the simple leaves. You got the pedital uh, that comes off the twig and it has one leaf on it. And that, that is considered a simple leaf. Whereas on your compound leaf, You've got the uh, pedestal, which comes off the twig, but it has many leaves on it. It has like two, four, six. We got seven leaves on that pedestal, whereas a simple leaf, you have one leaf on the uh, pedestal. So that is one uh, way of determining you know, whether it's a simple leaf or compound leaf. And the um, pedestals are connected to the twigs through the bud on both the compound and the uh, simple leaf. Now this here is a post oak leaf. It's deciduous, and uh, it, um, it can grow up to 50 feet. It's a slow growth tree. It's a shade wildlife. Um, it's in regions, uh, I think it's three through eight. But your post oak, and I tell a lot of people, tell the post oak <coughs> what the post oak tree is, is look at the leaf. The leaf, it looks like a cross. And uh, this will, you know, basically uh, is one of the ways you can you know, tell what a post oak is by looking at the uh, leaf. We got the loblolly. The loblolly pine is the, the conifer. Uh, it has the uh, needles and um, it grows to like, was it 300 feet? No, 100 feet. It is a, is a fast growing tree and um, it's in region one, two, three. Now I've seen it here, growing here in this parts of Leon and Robertson County. I do have live lolly pines and they do grow in uh, the two counties here, uh, especially I know in Robertson County because I have live lolly pines that grow in this uh, county. Now you've got the roots. 
you got the primary functions of the roots. You got the structural roots. The structural roots, you know, they help the tree stand up. They're like anchors. So they keep trying to keep the root from falling over or they, they keep it in place. It, it helps the uh, structure of the tree. You got the absorbing roots, all right? The absorbing roots are the roots that take in your water and your nutrients, uh, the ground. So this is another way uh, in which um, trees get their water and which goes up into the tree and uh, for the process of photosynthesis. Your lateral roots are your roots that go out to the side. Your lateral roots um, will help to keep the tree stable from falling over. Um, a lot of your uh, oak trees, I know this year or last year, a lot of your oak trees, lateral roots actually were dying back so that the tree was so tall or top heavy that the wind would just blow it over. It has nothing to keep it, you know, standing straight up. So what your, a lot of your, all your um, oak trees do have lateral roots. And then you've got the sinker roots, which is your, um, I call it a, uh, a root that goes straight down like a tap root. The, uh, the, the oak tree for the uh, tap root would be your Schumann red oak. It has a root that goes straight down. And that to me, it's your sinker roots. And um, your pine trees have a uh, tap root or sinker root. Your uh, pecan trees have them. So it also helps stabilize the uh, tree. Plus this is where they get all their <coughs> minerals and water and nutrients and stuff. <coughs> then you got the root hairs. They're the tiny hairs at the end of the roots. The, uh, and they take in a lot of the small minute minerals and also water that go up into the uh, tree, into the um, parts of the tree that help go up into the um, leaves to process for the uh, photosynthesis process. So, and this is your roots. These are like your primary functions. Now, how a tree grows. A tree increases in height and spread each year by adding a new growth of twigs. Now, these twigs will eventually turn into um, branches. You know, they start small and they get bigger as the tree gets bigger. The main food source for the tree is carbon particles, which would be your carbon dioxide from the air. Now the undersides of the leaves absorb this carbon. That's your um, stomatas. Those are the small um, holes in the underside of the leaves. And the uh, they take in the carbon dioxide and um, goes through the photosynthesis process and release oxygen. Mineral rich water is absorbed by the roots. You got to have water for the photosynthesis process. So the roots actually absorb the water, which goes up into the tree. So it's carried up through the sapwood to the leaves. And sapwood is one of the um, parts of the tree that we talked about earlier that uh, takes into the minerals and the water that goes up through the trees and to the leaves. And then there is combined with carbon from the air to process this food for the tree. And then um, we've got light and heat from the sun are required to complete this chemical process, which is known as photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is the main process. This is what helps this tree to uh, grow, helps it get bigger, gets, gets, you know, to where it is, and to the way, it, you know, it's supposed to look like. So, so this is the food process. So this food process is, is this food processed by the leaves is then sent to the inner bark to all growing parts of the tree, the roots, twigs, and cambium layer inside the trunk. Now the breathing pores of the entire tree also absorb oxygen. That's what I talked about earlier. You got your pores in, within the tree that, you know, they now they absorb oxygen. People ask me, well, uh, trees absorb carbon dioxide. Well, this is another different scientific version, but uh, we don't have time for me to get really into it. But um, but these pores also they'll, they'll also absorb oxygen, but then they'll release the oxygen. These pores are on the leaves, twigs, branches, trunks, and roots. Now the trees release oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis, and thereby helps clean the air that we breathe. 
Now, a large tree removes 60 to 70 times more air pollution than smaller trees. The water either evaporates or is absorbed, cleaned, and released through transpiration. So if you got a fog, you know, in, in the city and fog, you got a lot, it, it's got a lot of um, water or whatever in with it. Well, you got a lot of trees around. Well, they take all that in and it's like a, a filter. It filters out that fog where you get clean air out. You get clean oxygen. This is what we, this is what we need. This is what we use. Trees helping the trapping and filtering of pollutants, like what I said before. So trees are really, really good to have when it comes to big cities or anywhere out in the country or anywhere that helps. And it helps with health, people's health. If you've got trees that help with the pollution and stuff, then you, you, can, you can have good, healthy people, good, healthy people, animals, anything. Trees are good for energy conservation, screening, Farmers use trees for screen, like you, uh, they put them around their uh, gardens and stuff like that to help with the wind from um, blowing uh, dust or dirt or sand or whatever away from their uh, gardens. Erosion control. Trees are really good with erosion control because of the roots, help keep the uh, soil intact. And the aesthetics, trees look good. They can make your house look good. They can add a lot of uh, you know, value to your home or your buildings or to a city. But uh, tr trees are great. And so that was the end of your presentation. So are any any questions for Greg about the basic tree science about what a tree is? Well, if not, we're going to move on to our next pres uh, presenter. Uh, Cynthia Torno, and as we get trans uh, transitioned over here, uh, Cynthia, if you want to make your way closer to the microphone, here, I'll let you sit here. Thank you, Greg, for all that good information. Uh, now we're going to be talking about tree pruning basics. And uh, these slides were compiled by Courtney Blevins, who uh, is uh, an expert with the uh, Texas Forest Forestry Service. Um, first of all, the question, why prune? There we go. The objective of pruning is to produce strong, healthy, attractive plants. By understanding how, when, and why to prune, and by following a few simple principles, this objective can be achieved. Pruning for safety involves removing branches that could fall and cause injury or property damage, trimming branches that interfere with lines of sight on streets or driveways, and removing branches that grow into utility lines. Safety pruning can be largely avoided by carefully choosing species of trees that will not grow beyond the space available to them and have strength and form characteristics that are suited to the site. In addition, pruning can be used to stimulate fruit production and increase the value of timber. To encourage the development of a strong, healthy tree, we want to consider the following guidelines when pruning. Prune first for safety, next for health of the tree, and finally for aesthetics. We never prune trees that are touching or near utility lines. Instead, consult your local utility company. And we avoid pruning trees when you might increase uh, susceptibility to important pests. Uh, for example, in areas where oak wilt exists, we're not going to prune our oak trees in the spring and early uh, uh, summer. So from about February to uh, July, we don't prune oak trees. Okay, how does the tree respond to pruning? Uh, increases shoot growth. Uh, dwarfs young plants, uh, stimulates growth on spring flowering plants, reduces food supply to roots, and stops root growth. And this is a, sl <clears throat> a slide of the court cambrium and annual growth. And you can see the red around and the little branches coming out. And um, we're going to be talking about uh, areas where we don't prune. 
So uh, this is a slide of a tree branch that is diseased. And uh, notice, okay, uh, where we make our cut. Okay, we don't cut into the uh, tree, uh, uh, the heart of the tree, the tree bark. We want to come out from that, uh, from the a root collar, I mean, from the uh, a collar there and make a clean cut. Okay, uh, this is an example on our right uh, of a tree that was improperly uh, pruned. Uh, it was um, a um, stub cut and uh, notice how that disease has set up inside the, the trunk, okay, because uh, of the improper pruning. Uh, the slide on the left shows you where uh, the branch was properly pruned and how the tree itself has plugged off, okay, uh, that, that branch. And that's an example there of where disease, okay, has uh, gotten into the, the uh, trunk of the tree there. So we have uh, pruning techniques, okay, and, and uh, we have uh, a picture of the before and then uh, several different techniques, okay, for uh, uh, cutting the crown. Crown thinning. We favor branches with strong U-shaped angles of attachment. We move branches with weak V-shaped angles of attachment and are included bark. Ideally, lateral branches should be evenly spaced on the main stem of young trees. We want to remove any branches that rub or cross another branch. And we want to make sure that lateral branches are no more than one half to three quarters. Whoops. Get back. There we go. One half to three quarters of the diameter of the stem to discourage the development of co-dominant stems. Do not remove more than one quarter of the living crown of a tree at one time. It's necessary to, re if necessary to remove more, do it over successive years. Crown reduction. Use crown reduction pruning only when absolutely necessary. Make the pruning cut at a lateral branch that is at least one third the diameter of the stem to be removed. It is necessary, if it's necessary to remove more than half of the foliage from a branch, remove the entire branch. Crown raising. Always maintain live branches on at least two thirds of a tree's total height. Removing too many lower branches will hinder the development of a strong stem. Remove basil sprouts and vigorous epicormic sprouts. And I'll be showing you what an epicormic sprout is in just a minute. This is an example of a weak branch union. Notice it's characterized by very narrow angles of attachment and very weak unions. And this is an example of narrow forks and included bark. Included bark, bark that is enclosed between branches with narrow angles of attachment forming a wedge between the branches and very weak unions. And these are more examples of included bark. Okay, where to cut the limb? No stub cuts, no topping. Cut at the next lateral limb below the break, preferably a large lateral. Topping. This was a poor maintenance practice often used to control the size of trees. We see this done to create myrtles. It involves the indiscriminate cutting of branches and stems at right angles, leaving long stubs. Syn synonyms include rounding over, heading back, uh, dehorning, uh, capping, hat racking. Topping is often improperly referred to as pollarding. And you can see these poor ugly trees, okay, that have been topped. 
and all those little weak branches at the top are epicormic sprouts. An epicormic sprout is a shoot that arises from latent or adventitious buds, also known as water sprouts, that occur on stems and branches and suckers that are base uh, that are produced from the base of trees. In older wood, epicormic shoots often result from severe defoliation or radical pruning. Okay, this is what we don't want to do to our trees. Um, regrowth of topped branches. You can see, you know, how ugly these poor trees look with weakly attached sprouts. Pruning, where to cut the limb continued. Okay, cut beyond the branch bark ridge and collar. Okay, where to cut the limb continued. Okay, if you'll look at your diagram on the left, we see a piece of dead branch there. Okay, and how they've made a, a first cut, okay, before they make uh, the final cut. And notice how they've left the branch collar. They have a cut into that or the branch bark ridge. So no flush cuts and no stubs. If we follow the practice of not doing this, we'll prevent a lot of disease. Technique for dead branch removal. On a dead branch that has a collar of live wood, the final cut should be just beyond the outer edge of the collar. And this is a technique. Okay, well, let's go back to a typical pruning here. Let's see if I'll go back. There we go. A technique for a, uh, a apical tip or directional pruning on woody shrubs. How to cut the limb. This shows the making three cuts. For the first cut, this prevents bark stripping. First, they make uh, the small cut A, and then uh, B, they cut off, okay, the end there, and then finally C, the last cut there. And technique for small branch removal. There again, we don't want to get, okay, into the uh, trunk of the tree. There we go. And we, usually you can do this with your little clippers. Okay, below is an example of collaring, which we don't want. Wound wood. Lignified differentiated tissues produced on woody plants as a response to wounding. It's also known as callus tissue. And if you come to my house, you'll see a lot of my, po my uh, oaks with the, these calluses because we didn't know how to properly okay, prune them. Another example of callus. Where to make a reduction cut. Okay, first cut there. Okay, and then we see uh, the angled cut. You can spot the mistakes. Who would want a tree that looks like that? That's so sad. It's horrible. I know. See, disease is already set in there. Okay, and that's all I have on tree pruning. Any questions for Cynthia on uh, tree pruning? And on, if not, you know, we can, you know, uh, certainly come back at, at the very end uh, in regards to some questions. And, uh, but next up, we're going to move to uh, uh, Charlene Manning. Charlene is going to talk about uh, some common tree problems, tree diseases. And I know uh, for, for many of us, you know, this is 
these are the most common questions we get, you know, especially after the winter and the freeze we've got, you know, is my tree dead? Is this, is this a result of the freeze or is this a result of, of a disease? What can, can my tree be saved? So uh, Charlene, we appreciate you sharing your knowledge about some common tree problems and diseases. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is common tree problems, and this was uh, this was a very tough, not really a tough subject for me, but to keep it down to the because there were so many to choose from. So so Richard and I just kind of sat down and decided just to pick a few that you might want to um, uh, hear just real quick tonight. So anyway. My presentation is going to be a little longer than the other two, so y'all get ready. <laughs> okay, it's the era, right? Okay. Many factors in our environment stress trees and can, and can set in motion for tree decline. And some of those factors are construction, which can damage the roots, um, and that once that happens, it can keep the water and minerals from getting to the tree. Um, your driveways can uh, be uh, a bad factor. Uh, patios, sidewalks. Uh, some other ones that um, are out of your control would be drought, flooding, hail damage, hot or cold weather. So today we're just gonna go over, this is my short list of common uh, tree problems that we're just gonna cover this evening. And uh, the first one will be hypoxylon canker, bacteria, uh, wet wood, wood boring beetles, leaf galls, mechanical damage, and oak wilt. So the first one on the list is hypoxylon canker. And uh, what that is, it's a disease that appears as a dead lesion on limbs, branches, and trunks of affected trees. The canker develops under the bark and the decay contributes to the tree mortality. I tried to look up pictures on the internet and try to get as close uh, up views that I could to help you uh, help you see exactly what these diseases and fungus and all that is, but you can see the dark spots there on the, on the tree where it's already started. Um, Hypoxylon canker is a fungus. It, it is an opportunist that attracts trees that have been weakened by factors that we just covered in the other slide, heat, drought, wound, in, uh, root injury or other diseases. So you're, you're gonna keep hearing this over and over in my presentation um, about a healthy tree is a, is, uh, a tree that, uh, w that can withstand or um, not even get these diseases at all. So um, the spores uh, are primarily spread by wind and after a wet and rainy weather, and they infect the tree at wounds and breaks in the bark. So go, kind of going back to Cindy's presentation, that's why you, you need to know how to properly prune a tree uh, is one of the ways it can get a wound um, uh, so that you can prevent these diseases from happening to your tree. Uh, the fungus is likes warm temperatures from 60 to 80 degrees. It affects, now this isn't all, you know, every tree, but just to give you a short listing of, of tree types that it affects is black jack, live oak, post oak, Texas red oak, southern red oak, water oak, and white oaks. The symptoms uh, are yellowing and brown leaves, small leaves and reduced twig growth, a thinning canopy, dead limbs and branches, the uh, cormic shoots that Cindy was just talking about, the water sprouts, uh, uh, growing on tree trunks and large limbs, feeder roots dying back, white stringy sapwood in the cankered area. Um, as the above symptoms progress, the outer bark falls from the tree and exposes the fungus. So on this 
uh, a sample, you can see how the bark is falling off the tree and you've got that dark um, uh, fungus there kind of below the bark there. Once uh, the hypoxylin canker is evident, it's usually too late to save the tree. <clears throat> but you can kind of control this ha from happening to your tree by prevent factors that lead to the stress. Keep your trees irrigated. Here we go. Prevent wounds from, from mechanical weather or insect injury. There's no known cure. Proper management practices can significantly reduce the problems. There is remedial action that you can take. There's a vertical mulching, a, a remedial pruning, and then last is tree removal. Um, Okay, so, we're, so that's one. And then the second one that we're going to cover is bacteria wet wood. It's also known as slime flux. Bacteria, it's a bacterial infection in the inner sapwood and the outer heartwood areas of the tree. The bacterial wet wood has wet soaked patches and weeps from visible wounds, normally associated with wounding or environmental stress. Bacteria that causes wet wood tolerates low oxygen. So you can see on the slide here, uh, it, it's not a really, really good picture, but you can see the lighter area or the real light, the dark, and then the real light where the, where the tree is weeping. The symptoms of bacteria wet wood is water soap patches and patches and weeping from visible wounds, a sour odor, and the foliage may wilt and branches die back. The sour odor comes from the buildup of bacteria that causes fermentation. Uh, it's not uncommon for a secondary infection of fungi and bacteria to, in to infect the surface liquid and create a slimy texture on the bark. Some of the trees that are affected by uh, bacterial wet wood are elm, crab apple, birch, maple, dogwood, oaks, pine, redbud, sycamore, and tulip trees. I know tulip trees for a while were real popular around here, so I wanted to make sure if people still had them that they, that, to know that they are acceptable to bacteria wet wood. Prevention and control. There's no known controls for bacteria wet wood. Affected trees usually will overcome the problem and seal off the damage. Do not use insecticides and avoid wounding the tree. Trim away broken or torn branches and avoid stress. A healthy tree will overcome wet wood. If you want to just do something for cosmetic purposes, you can uh, do a bleach solution of 10%, uh, a 10% bleach solution, but that's for cosmetic reasons. It's not going to do anything to, uh, uh, to speed up the recovery of the tree. The actual weeping is really a good sign. It's allowing for a slow, natural draining of the infection. But don't get the bright idea that you'll drill a whole bunch of more holes in there and make it go faster, because all you're gonna do at that time is just spread the bacteria. So just leave it alone, let it do its thing. Um, they, uh, they really don't want you using insecticides because if you notice some insects feeding on the rot, there's a good chance that those insects are actually helping the tree and not, uh, not hurting the tree. Okay, prevention and control. You can reduce the damage by removing turf and grass from around the tree trunk. Uh, okay, this is out of order somehow. <laughs> okay, listen, I don't think that's in the right order. 
Okay, we'll just go with it. I, I, maybe so, I don't know. Uh, anyway, prevention and control. Reduce damage by removing the turf grass from around the tree trunk, adding two inch layer of mulch to protect the exposed tree roots. And you, okay, we're right, it's right. Okay, I, I have this on another slide too. So uh, adding a vinyl tree guard around the tree will also help. Uh, uh, from preventing wounds is what uh, uh, wounds from your uh, weed eater and from your uh, lawnmower. Uh, so remember injury to any part of a tree can create an entrance for diseases and insects. Uh, so there we go back to our proper pruning and that sort of stuff. Uh, Okay, wood boring insects will be our next uh, uh, problem that we'll go over. And insect borers include beetles, weevils, moths, and caterpillars. Uh, borer, borer insects uh, or borer infestations can go unnoticed until the tree has already begun to die. So many insects make up their home in the bark the trunks and the branches of the tree. Most insects borers are attracted to wheat, damaged, dead, or dying wood. So if you get a wood boring insect, uh, your tree is, is already, it is already in decline by the time they show up. Uh, wood boring insects are called your primary invaders. They come in once the tree is weakened, then they come in. Um, uh, the wood boring insects produce a sawdust um, um, increment called frasis. Um, they tunnel into the uh, inner bark that transports nutrients and water to the leaves. Uh, so if you remember what Greg said, you have your outer bark and then you have your inner bark and bam, you're there. You know, there's not much between the two there. Uh, your secondary invaders arrive only after the plant has weakened. So you have your wood boring in, insects that are your primary in, invaders, your beetles, weevils, moths, caterpillars. Your secondary in, uh, invaders that come in are your carpenter bees, carpenter ants, and termites. Now they don't, they don't, uh, they don't necessarily kill the tree, but they are contributors to the tree. Um, some of the trees that are affected by wood boring insects are the Arizona ash, birch, cottonwood, your flowering stone fruits, and your willow trees. Okay, I will apologize before I start this one to your to the enemyologists out there that like bugs, <laughs> but beetles are, are one of the wood boring insects and there are many species of beetles and they come in unique colors and sizes, but they all can very, be very destructive to trees. They tunnel into the tree and they feed on the inner wood. And one of our most concerned beetles that we have is the emerald ash borer beetle. It is here in Texas. It's been reported in Tarrant County in 2018. I researched and researched and was not able to find if it is in Leon County or even how close to Leon County. It, it is not currently in Leon County. I know that the Texas A&M Forest Service has traps all across up and down East Texas. And fortunately, it has not yet been located in Leon or Freestone County. Very good, because I could not find anything on it. Uh, it kills stressed and healthy trees. Uh, emerald ash borer is very aggressive. It weakens the tree in the winter and kills them by the summer. Now, it, it, it could take a little bit long in that, but that's kind of the saying that goes with the emerald ash borer, uh, borer is, that, is that it weakens in the winter, kills it in, by summer, but it takes sometimes a little bit longer than that. Uh, the adult beetle feeds on the ash leaves and deposits eggs on the bark of the tree. The eggs hatch, then the larva goes into the inside tissue of the tree where the water conducting tissue is. And 
and it kills every species of ash trees. And you can look at your slide there. Um, the top one is an emerald ash borer. He's kind of pretty, but <laughs> unfortunately, he just does a lot of damage. Um, you can see also his hole uh, right above on the top picture there. Right above, you can see his hole going into the tree. Um, he's about a half an inch long. So in the second picture on the penny there, you can kind of see how big he is. Uh, the U.S. has 16 native ash trees, and every one of them are acceptable to uh, the emerald ash borer. The symptoms are the same as any other uh, ash borer um, uh, insect. Um, it was unknown in the U.S. until 2002. Uh, the first case was in southeast Michigan. The next wood boring insects are weevils. Uh, the, uh, the Texas has the um, Diordor uh, weevil that attacks trunks during the winter where the young, where tr young trees are planted in very poor planting sites. <coughs> the caterpillars are immature stages of several kinds of moth. The adult weevil, as you can see in the top picture there, he has an extended snout. That's where his chewing mouth parts are located. And then the, um, and then the larva feed underneath the bark. They do not tunnel, the larva does it. Uh, the caterpillar um, that we, that the caterpillar pillar boring uh, insects are uh, carpenter worms, peach tree borers, southern cone worm, and American plum borer. The symptoms are winding tunnels below the bark that makes the outer layer of the tree bark wrinkle or bumpy. They make D-shaped holes in the bark. And that's another way you know you have wood boring beetles or insects is by the D shape of the uh, hole in the bark. Uh, discolored leaves start at the top of the tree and dead branches. Of course, you'll kind of notice on a lot of these um, uh, uh, diseases and funguses and stuff. I mean, the symptoms are almost all the same. So you have to kind of look for other factors there that of, of when you're diagnosing um, on what your, your tree problem might be. Uh, not all boring woods insects have D-shaped holes, but most do. And pruning wounds are the most common entry point for borer insects. <coughs> so, but let's not, but often mistaken for uh, uh, wood boring holes is a woodpecker hole. So woodpeckers make square holes. And like I said, that the most of your wood boring insects will make D shaped holes. So the picture up above there is a woodpecker hole, which you can see it's more square ish. Uh, 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 the bottom is very square, but the top rounds, it seems just a little bit, but basically it's a square. The, the, uh, the tree on the bottom is some that the wood borers have bored, and the bottom one, you can root the hole there, you can really tell the D-shape. The top one is a little hard to tell that it's a D-shape. All that sawdust is that frass that I was telling you about that is the uh, extract or what from the uh, beetle. So uh, it's basically just digested wood is what it is. Uh, the woodpecker that uh, the picture is a pleated woodpecker in case anybody wants to know that. But so be sure you look real close and um, uh, and make sure that it's not, if, if you're afraid you have uh, wood borers, that it's actually not a uh, woodpecker hole. Now, extensive woodpecker woodpecker activity could mean could mean a sign of the emerald uh, uh, ash borer. So you might keep that in mind also. Prevention and control. There you go again. Keep your trees healthy. 
uh, consider using a plastic trunk protectors. I don't know a whole lot about that at all. That was one of the suggestions, but I say go with the top one there and just keep your trees have uh, keep your trees healthy. Remove any destroyed, heavily infested limbs. Uh, a good flowing sap from a healthy tree defends the tree from damage by many borer pests, but not not the uh, emerald ash borer, but from some of the other ones. Um, uh, <clears throat> wrapping the tree trunks to prevent borer attacks is ineffective uh, by using the tree trunk protectors from weed trimmers and um, lawnmowers might be a good idea, but the tree wraps are, are don't do any, they do nothing. So <laughs> chemical use uh, uh, to get rid of uh, some uh, of your insects. Uh, some of the uh, insecticides are professional or for commercial use only. You may have to have a pesticide applicator's license, and some of the products are preventive only. Only a few products are for for retail sale. Uh, it, it's just best to seek a seek a professional. Uh, so, best prevention is to maintain a healthy tree. <coughs> Leaf galls. Uh, galls are caused by insects laying eggs or feeding on the branches of the tree. Galls are a re which I thought this was very interesting. Galls are a reaction to the mixing of chemicals between the insect and the tree chemicals. And when they come in contact together, that's what forms the galls. And the shape of the galls is determined by each insect. So each insect will dictate what the shape of the gall may be. Um, and they are, uh, uh, most galls causing insects are, are, leaf, are tiny leaf sucking wasp, which is the mealy wasp, a wasp. But galls can be round, dense, woolly, fuzzy, bullet shaped or horned. And in one of my, when I was doing some research on this, I actually saw a horned gall that was very, very kind of space looking. It was really different looking. Um, insects, live, uh, insects live in the gall and feed on its tissue. Mealy galls being the most popular type of gall that lives on oak trees. There are 700 species of gall forming insects. 80% of them form on oaks. Prevention and control. Uh, this is just a picture here on this slide of just another type of gall. Uh, heavy infestation may cause early leaf drop. Choose varieties that are not host to gall making insects. Now, if you move on a place and you've already got trees or if you live on property and the trees are already there, that, that one really isn't going to uh, uh, benefit you. Um, let the natural predators control the infestation. Galls grow in harmony with the nature of the growth of the tree. Galls provide homes to many beneficial insects when the gall insect leaves. A lot of uh, trees that are affected by galls are oaks and ashes. Okay, this mechanical damage. If you don't listen to anything I say through any of this, please listen to this slide because mechanical damage is the number one enemy of trees by wood, weed trimmers and lawn mowers. Mechanical damage, can, a tree wounds can seriously affect the tree's vascular system and prevent it from its normal activity. Uh, so there again, just under the bark is the vascular system that carries the water and elements up and down the tree. Okay, oak wilt. Um, 
I know a lot of people are concerned about oak wilt and you could go on and on and on all day about oak wilt. So I tried to shorten it and give you the best information uh, that I could. So uh, one of the most destructive trees diseases in the US is oak wilt. It's an infectious disease caused by a fungus that disables the water conducting system in trees. Uh, um, all oak species can be infected by oak wilt. It really likes the red oaks. Uh, 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 white oaks are the most acceptable, uh, uh, no, are the least acceptable of the uh, oak wilt disease. And some of your white oaks might even make it, might even live. Um, but uh, oak wilt can be, um, you can, disease is carried two ways, above ground, which are sap feeding bark beetles feeding on spore mats that form between the bark and the wood of an infected tree. And they get on these spore mats, which spore mats is just the, uh, the pressure in, once it gets the oak wilt fungus, uh, the pressure inside the tree causes these cracks in the bark and then the cracks in the bark leak this uh, oak mat. It, uh, it, it's a black mat thing and then uh, that is surrounded by the trees and uh, are, are the split in the tree and then the beetles come to feed on that and, um, and so that, that's what a mat is. Uh, the, the spore mats. And, and then they get on that mat, it's sweet, kind of sweet tasting or sweet smelling. And then they get it, that mat on, on them, and then they just carry it from tree to tree. Also, it can be carried by tree roots, which I found this extremely interesting. I, and when I first heard about oak wheel, I heard this, but it just didn't, I don't know, it just didn't register me with me. And then when I started studying for this, it just kind of hit me. Oh my goodness. It's so groups of oaks have connecting root systems. So if you have a stand of oaks, the, their root systems are connected and they actually grow together. And uh, the roots are known to graft together, forming these continuous underground networks. So your oak trees can actually network with each other and they can connect as far as a hundred feet away. So that's another way that it can be transferred is, is through underground. The symptoms of oak wheel, if you'll see the picture, to me, the most common picture that you, when you look up and see oak wheel, you see the live oak, how the veining, the yellow veining, to me, that's your most prominent picture when you think of oak wheel. But, you know, your red oaks and white oaks also get it. And their, uh, their um, symptoms on their leaves are a little bit different. And the second picture below is a picture, I believe it's red oak leaves that have oak wheel. But it was, it, it first will be observed at the top part of the tree. The leaves uh, do develop the yellow uh, color, uh, uh yellowing of the leaves that eventually turn brown. Uh, um, the most reliable diagnosis of oak wheels is to observe the leaf veins on the leaves. The disease is spread by oak bark, sap feeding beetles and root grafts. It's a, if you think you have oak wilt, it's really uh, a good idea just to get an expert uh, to come out there and look at your tree. And, and like I said earlier, all uh, the, symptoms of oak wheel on each, on each oak species is really just a little bit different. Um, su successful management of oak wheel depends on correct diagnosis and understanding of how the pathogen spreads from each oak species. So there again, you know, I was telling you earlier, there's a whole lot of diseases out there and funguses on trees that we just didn't have time to cover this evening that somewhat have the same symptoms sometimes. So you have to really make sure that you are properly diagnosing what is wrong with your tree. 
Early detection and prompt action are essential for successful management of oak wilt disease. Now we don't have oak wilt yet here. Um, so uh, that is one good thing. Um, prevention. Well, uh, there's just not a whole, whole lot you can do, but it, it's, but there's a little bit that you can do. And you can cut and dispose of diseased red oaks immediately. So if your red oak has uh, oak wilt disease, you need to do not let the wood lay on the ground, get rid of it immediately. You can burn it. Uh, oak wilt dies once it gets uh, to a certain temperature, it does kill it. Um, avoid, once again, avoid wounding your trees altogether. Uh, handle uh, oak firewood, hand, yeah, handle oak firewood cautiously. Burn all your firewood in one season. Well, for those of us who depend on firewood for heat, that's not, that one can be a little bit tough to do because I know we don't like to uh, go into the next season of firewood without any firewood. So uh, just, uh, uh, but if you can burn it all before spring, it's just a good idea to do that. Uh, cover unseasoned firewood, cover it. Uh, and plant other types of trees for diversity in your landscape. So kind of what that mean is, means is don't have all red oaks and nothing else. Uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So, but if you've bought a place that all has mature trees on it, there really isn't a whole lot that you can probably uh, do with that, except if you go to plant a new tree, plant a different type of native tree for uh, Texas. Uh, I always like to end my presentations with a quote. So uh, I found this one. Uh, it is not so much for its beauty that the forest makes a claim upon men's hearts as for that sub subtle, subtle something, that quality of air and imagination emanation from old trees that so wonderfully changes and renews a weary spirit. So, and to end here, I would like to give y'all some resources that y'all can, and we'll leave this slide up for a little while. So uh, there is a wealth of information, uh, information out there on the internet. I mean, it, it's just a Texas A&M, uh, T-A-M-U, I mean, there, it's just uh, endless what you can find on there. I had no trouble really finding a whole lot of my information. So uh, the, here's a few, the AgriLife Extension, T-A-M-U, E-D-U website, the Texas Oak, uh, oakwilt.org. I found a great brochure that if you want to run it off, you can find it for Oakwilt. I mean, it goes into great depth. Uh, you can find it. Uh, uh, it's on the forest, U.S. Agricultural Forestry Service. The name of the brochure is How to Identify and Prevent and Control Oakwilt. The number of the brochure is that NA-FR-01-11. There's also Texas tree planting at T-A-M-U-E-D-U. -E There's Texas tree ID, T-A-M-U-E-D-U. -E and uh, also uh, the uh, Texas A&M has a plant disease handbook that you can find at plant disease handbook. Uh, dot T A M U E D U. Uh, it's under landscaping. So it's a uh, eight step program on how to prevent oak wilt. So, uh, and then the one, Richard, the. Uh, uh, another resource is the Texas AM Forest Service. They have a very extensive website that has a, a great, a lot of great resources on there in regards to planting a tree. Uh, properly locating a tree in regards to power lines and houses. Uh, they've got resources on there as far as pruning. Uh, they've got a, a, a resource on there depending upon where you live in, in Texas. You can uh, pick your county and it will tell you what are the best types of trees to plant in your county. 
Uh, so you can look up, just do a Google search for Texas A&M Forest Service, or you can go to tfsweb.tamu.edu. And that's another resource uh, uh, for tree information. Uh, I know our time is about up, but do we have any questions in regards to tree diseases? <laughs> yes, I have a question. Hi, well, this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I've learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, what's your question? Yes, the question is regarding the loquat tree. Uh, it, my tree, I had a tree in the yard, it was damaged. And I thought I was going to have to dig it up and it looked like it was dead. But then back in March, there were some leaves, little leaves starting at the bottom of it. And so it seemed like they pop out at different points. And I wanted to know, it's a delicate tree. I hate to take it up, but I wanted to treat it with care. What would you suggest I do? Uh, with that tree in terms of pruning. There are some dead leaf uh, branches at the top of it. It's about a 10, I say about a maybe 20 foot tree. Okay, so so the, the leaf the leaf growth that you're seeing at the bottom, is it is it coming off of the trunk itself or is it coming from like some sap or some sucker, some sucker uh, branches coming off from the bottom? Uh, some sucker branches coming off from the bottom. Okay, so if you're seeing growth from suckers at the bottom, that tells me that the top of the tree is dead. Right. Uh, okay. what, what, that tree is trying its best to maintain life by having those suckers come up from the bottom. Yes. But the okay. top of the tree is pretty much dead. Um, okay. Now, I know that's probably not what you wanted to hear. <laughs> So you can do one of two things. You can either try, you can either go ahead and, and trim that tree back and maintain those suckers. Now, uh, your loquat, were you getting any production off of your loquat prior to the top dying back? Yes, sir, I was. Yeah. Eh, you may or may not get production off of the suckers. So what you can do is, you know, maintain those suckers and have you a nice little bush or a little tree. But if you're looking for production, I would say you're probably going to need to just remove the tree and start fresh with a new loquat tree. Okay. Well, that's what I was thinking. I wanted to use it as a small bush if it if it wasn't dead it was in my front yard. Do you recommend using a like a chainsaw to trim those hedges off? Are the, are those dead branches off? Yes, I use a chainsaw as part of the safety uh, chainsaw and, and um, you know, wear goggles and gloves and stuff like that and start, uh, you got a chainsaw, how, how tall is the tree? It's a little like it's somewhere between 15 to 20 feet. Okay, um, yeah, I would get a chainsaw. If you're gonna do it yourself, um, I'd be, you know, just careful where you're cutting it, where it, when it falls, it falls away from you. And then you can cut that, that part up. Or if you want to get a tree trimmer, but they cost, but you can actually cut it to where uh, if you got room around the tree, you, you cut those branches and they fall away from you. Then you just cut them up and you just keep trimming the tree until, you know, you get the whole tree cut down. Okay. okay. And what other diseases should I look out for? You know, In with... With, with a low quad, you know, I would certainly look for some of those wood boring beetles. Uh, they certainly especially like fruit trees. Uh, I, I would, uh, that would be the main thing I would look for with that low quad is, is those wood boring beetles. You know, okay. and, and I know that uh, Charlene said, you know, keeping a tree healthy is the key to disease prevention. Well, you know, if you've got a, a, in a landscape situation, that's pretty easy. You can Put a water hose on a tree and give it a little bit of fertilizer and you can keep it healthy and keep it out of stress but if you've got a large yard or if you've got some acreage uh, with a lot of trees on it you're going to be in some trouble you're going to have to decide okay this is the tree or these are the few trees i'm, I'm going to focus on and the rest are just going to have to fend for themselves so like i said in, in a landscape situation it's much easier to keep those trees healthy than in a large uh, acreage field or pasture woodland type setting Okay, thank you. Very helpful. Any any other questions? Like so we are recording uh, this presentation, so uh, probably um, tomorrow, uh, once I get the video link uh, edited and uploaded, 
I will email you, uh, you each of you, the, the link to the video. Also, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put it in the chat box, uh, uh, but I will also email you uh, a link as well with an evaluation uh, for tonight's program. Uh, we wanna see, you know, uh, we want your opinion. We want your thoughts about how our presenters did. And I know they were very nervous. Uh, uh, to do this, you know, as I said, they are uh, learning how to uh, be tree experts. And so uh, we appreciate them sharing their knowledge uh, with us. Uh, so I'm um, looking for the chat feature. And for some reason, I'm not- This is Aaron Richard. I already post, um, I already shared the survey link in the chat box. Perfect, so, so thank you, Aaron. So if yep. you want to take a few moments either this evening or, or later on to you know provide some feedback on that survey and so we can uh you know uh, we value your your opinions good or bad and you know this will help us to provide uh uh educational programs to meet your needs in the future as well so any any other questions either from uh, our participants or aaron anything from the chat box there was one question in the chat box, but I answered it. So I think we're good. Unless Marcy, do you have any other questions? Oh, no, that's all, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Alrighty, well, we appreciate your participation this evening. We hope it was beneficial for you. We hope that you learned something and we uh, hope that you have a better understanding about how you can care for your tree because your tree is a great valuable asset to your landscape. It, you know, it can provide aesthetic value, lower your cooling and heating costs. I mean, so many benefits to a tree. Uh, so, you know, we you know, hopefully now we'll have a better understanding of how to take care of your tree. And if at any time you have any questions, please uh, contact your local office of the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and we will be happy to assist you with your tree problem or any other issues you might have. And thank you to our presenters, Greg, Cynthia, Charlene, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us this evening.